face is blood. They circled round and they closed in. And Odysseus, he backed away a little bit. And he yelled. He yelled out to his companions three times. This was as loud as a yell as a man's head can hold. And Menelaus, Menelaus heard that yell three times. And right away, he said to Ajax, he said, who's standing next to him, conveniently. <laughs> Menelaus said, Ajax, son of Telamon, you who are the marshal of the people, I think that I have heard Odysseus cry out, and it sounds to me like he's being pressed hard by the Trojans. It sounds to me like they've cut him off now. So come on, let's go together. It will be better to defend him. As awesome as Odysseus is, I'm worried that the Trojans will do something to him, and then, then the Danaeans will really miss him. That's what he said. And Menelaus started out, and Ajax, a man like a god, followed after him, and they found Odysseus. Now, Odysseus, he was surrounded by Trojans like, like jackals like jackals up in the woods, in the mountains, when they find the body of a horned deer, a horned deer that was hit by an arrow, but was able to run away on its feet as long as its blood was still flowing and its knees were still moving, but then finally the bitter arrow took it over and beat it down, and now, now the flesh-eating jackals surround it and devour it. Until God sends a lion. And the lion comes and scatters all of the jackals, and then the lion eats the, the corpse in the shady glade. That's how it was, all of the Trojans around Odysseus, but he kept darting at them, pushing them away, holding off his merciless death day. And then Ajax came and stood next to him with his shield like a tower. And he scattered the Trojans willy-nilly, and Menelaus, Menelaus led Odysseus out of the crowd by the hand, close to their chariot, to rush back to the hollow ships. Now, Ajax. Ajax leapt on Doraclus. <laughs> Then, Pandocus. <laughs> Lysandros. Parasos. Pilates. Now, Ajax. Ajax was like an overflowing river, a river that flows down from the mountain and is swollen in the winter after a deluge from Zeus, and it washes away all of the dry oak trees and the pines, all of it as driftwood that it throws into the sea. This is how shining Ajax went, driving confusion among men and horses as he cut across the plain. And Hector, Hector didn't know anything about what was going on. <laughs> Hector was over on the left flank of the battle, on the banks of the river Scamandros. That's where the most heads were falling. It was where the unquenchable battle cry rose up all around Idomeneus and Nestor. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> But Hector, he was cutting men down, doing bad deeds with his chariots and with his spears, but the Argives, oh, those guys. <laughs> they would not let him, they would not move away from his path. Not until Alexander, also known as Paris, who was the husband of Helen with the good hair, 
<laughs> he hit Maka'on. Maka'on, the shepherd of the people who was being awesome. <laughs> Alexander hit him in the right shoulder with a tri-barbed arrow. Yeah, it did hurt. <laughs> and right away, Idomeneus said to Nestor, Nestor, son of Nellius, you are the great kudos of the Achaeans. Now you have to get up on your chariot and get Makaon back towards the hollow ships. He is a doctor. And a doctor is worth more than many other men. A doctor can cut out arrows and spread gentle drugs on wounds. That's what he said. And Nestor, the son of Nellius, did not disobey. But right away, he got up into his chariot, and Makaon got up next to him, and they whipped the horses out of battle. And the horses went, not unwillingly, because they wanted to go. Meanwhile, Cabriones, Cabriones saw that Cabriones, <laughs> who, by the way, is Hector's charioteer at this point and a bastard son of Priam, <laughs> Cabriones saw that the Trojans were being driven back on the center flank of battle. And so, standing next to Hector, he said to him, Hector, you and I, we are fighting with this crowd of Danaeans over on the edge of battle. But there in the center, the Trojans, they are being driven back. And I recognize Ajax, the son of Telamon, who's driving them in confusion. I see him by his wide shield across his shoulders. So come on, we can drive our horses straight there. That's where cavalryman and cavalryman are throwing conflict against one another, foot soldier versus foot soldier. That's where the unquenchable battle cry has arisen. <laughs> That's what he said, and Hector did not disobey. But right away they drove the fast horses, being between the Trojans and the Achaeans, running over corpses and over shields. The axles of their chariot were spattered with blood, and the edges of the chariot car, and the wheels and the horses' hooves spattered everything with blood. And Hector, Hector, he wanted to jump right into the crowd. <laughs> he was not for long going to hold back with his spear. No, now, now he went through the ranks of his men with spear and sword and thrown stones. <laughs> but he always avoided fighting with Telamonian Ajax and never once would face him in battle. <laughs> but now, Zeus, Zeus from up on above, he threw fear into Ajax's chest. <coughs> and Ajax, Ajax froze, stunned, and he turned away. But he didn't move one knee past the other too much. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, he was like a lion, like a lion that goes into a courtyard trying to get a cow, but there's all these men and dogs that come after him, and they're beating at him with their fiery torches, throwing things from their hands, but the lion, the lion is hungry, right? But the men, they're not going to let him get the fat of the cow, so they keep beating at him, and the lion keeps going, and finally, at dawn, the lion goes away, sad in his heart. That's how Ajax was now. <laughs> sad in his heart as he went away from the Trojans, though he didn't want to. He didn't want to retreat. But he started running towards the ships. But no, now he was like a stubborn donkey. Now he was like a stubborn donkey that goes into the fields and wants to eat all of the grain, but there are a bunch of kids there with sticks, and the kids are beating him with the sticks. But the donkey's like, Arr. and the kids are like, Arr. but the kids are just kids, so they're weak, right? So that means that the donkey doesn't actually leave the field until he's had his fill of the grain. 
Now that's how Ajax is. And the Trojans are like little kids. They're trying to stab his huge shield with his spears. But then Ajax remembers his furious courage. And he breaks through the ranks of horse-breaking Trojans. But then, then he turns around again, like a wild animal looking everywhere, and starts to run again. Back towards the ships. Oh. But no. Now, he goes everywhere. He will not let a single person get past him to the ships. Now he runs, taking a stand between the Trojans and the Achaeans. And they are all throwing their spears at him. And they are all hitting the middle of his shield before they ever get to taste his delicate skin. And many of those spears they go and fix in the ground even though they wanted to fix in his flesh. And Eurypylus, Eurypylus sees Ajax struggling, pressed hard by all of these thrown spears, and so Eurypylus comes and stands next to him, and Eurypylus aims a spear and hits Asapau. That's right, except it's Apisao, and I always get it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and his Apisao, who's the son of Faustius, hits him right in the guts and loosens his limbs. And now Eurypylus comes and rushes on him, stripping his armor, and Alexander, <laughs> Alexander sees Eurypylus stripping Apisao's armor and aims his arrow at him, <laughs> and shoots, <laughs> and hits Eurypylus in the right thigh. And the shaft breaks off, and the whole leg goes dead. And so Eurypylus has to run back into the crowd of his companions <laughs> and escape black death. And then he calls out to all the Danaeans with a piercing cry, friends! Counselors and leaders of the Argives. Now we have to turn around. We have to take a stand around Telamonian Ajax. He is being hard pressed by many spears. I don't know if he's going to make it out of the ill sounding battle alive. So come, let's take a stand all around Telamonian Ajax. That's what he said. And all of the men came. All of the men came around him, and they leaned their shields against his shoulders, and they held up their spears. And Ajax, Ajax was able to duck back into the crowd of his companions, turning and taking a stand. Meanwhile, <laughs> Nestor and Makaon arrived safely out of battle. And Achilles. Achilles saw this from up on the prow of his ship. There it is. <laughs> That's where he was watching the hard work and the terrible upset. And he called out to Patroclus. And Patroclus heard him from inside his tent, and Patroclus came out. A man like a god. <laughs> a man like a god. <laughs> this is where all the trouble begins for Patroclus. I'm serious. Patroclus comes out and he says, Achilles. Why have you called me? What do you need? And fast-footed, brilliant Achilles says to him, Patroclus, son of Minoetius, you have always delighted my heart. Now the Achaeans will come begging me on their knees. Now their need has grown so great they will not stand it. But go. Go and 
see who Nestor, the son of Neleus, has brought out of the battle. It looked from behind exactly like Makaon, but I did not see his face. His horses rushed straight past. And Patroclus, Patroclus did not disobey his dear friend, but right away ran through the ships in the tent. But Makaon and Nestor, when they arrived back in Nestor's tent, well, they jumped down off their chariots and right onto the earth that feeds many men. We're on the earth. And that's when Eurymedon, who is Nestor's sidekick, took the horses and unhitched them from the chariot. And then Nestor and Makaon, they took their tunics and they washed all the sweat out of them. And then they stood on the shore of the salt sea and they just took a deep breath. And then they went inside the tent and they sat on couches. <laughs> now, Hecamede, Hecamede, who is a woman who has beautiful braids, she's the daughter of Arsinoes. She was taken from Thenedos when, when Achilles sacked it. And the Achaeans, they chose her out for Nestor because the old man was the best at giving advice. You know, that's what you do. Hecamede came and set a well polished table out. It had cobalt feet, and on the table she put a beautiful bronze basket and an onion relish for the wine. Then there was bread and honey and the holy, the holy barley cakes. And then Hecamede brought a cup out. The cup, this cup was one of the old man's from his house, Nestor's. It was studded with golden nails. It had four ears as handles. There were two golden doves that sat on either side, and it had two bases. Now, this cup, any other man could not have lifted this cup from the table. Not when it was full, anyway. But Nestor, the old man, <laughs> he lifted that cup up with no work at all. <laughs> Now Hecamede decided to make, oh, she was a girl like a goddess. Hecamede made them a potion. She took the Pramian wine and she took goat cheese and grated it into the wine with a bronze cheese grater. <laughs> and then she sprinkled white barley into it and she made the potion and she ordered them to drink. Now I have thought about this. This is kind of like a power smoothie, right? Maybe like a power smoothie reverse risotto. Um, then when they had put away their desire for eating and drinking, that's when Nestor and Makaon turned their pleasure to conversation, to talking. <laughs> Except that's also when Nestor realized that Patroclus, a man like a god, was standing in the doorway. <laughs> and right away, Nestor jumped up and grabbed Patroclus by the hands and greeted him and ordered him to sit down. But Patroclus, Patroclus said, Don't order me, old man. You will not convince me. The man is resentful and shameless who sent me here to find out who you've brought out of battle wounded, and I can see for myself that it's Makaon, the shepherd of the people. You know that man Achilles is terrible. He is very fast to blame, even the blameless. That's what Patrick was said. But Nestor, <laughs> the son of Nellius, <clears throat> answered him, <clears throat> why, why then is Achilles now so concerned about 
Which one of the Achaeans has been injured? When so many of us have been hit, Achilles has no idea what we have been suffering. How so many of us are now laid up in ships, wounded with Trojan arrows or spears. Brilliant Odysseus has been hit. Agamemnon has been hit. Eurypylus, Eurypylus got an arrow through the thigh. And this other man here, too, also got an arrow from a man's string. Achilles, he might be awesome, but he does not care and does not pity the Achaeans at all. How long will he wait? Will he wait until all of the ships are on fire? Will he wait until we are killed one after another? If only there was still strength in my gnarled limbs. If only I was still young and my strength was still steadfast. Like the time when the Epeans fought the Pylians over cows. <laughs> now, Heracles had, several years before that, Heracles had come to Pylos, to my hometown, and he had decimated the city. There once were twelve blameless sons of Neleus, but Heracles killed all the rest, so I was the only one who was left. So there we were in Pylos, there weren't very many of us left. We had suffered a lot. And the Apeans, the Apeans owed us. They owed us a great debt, but now they abused us. They looked down on us. They schemed evil against us. So I decided to steal their cows. <laughs> First, I killed Itemius, while he was being awesome, I mean, he was blameless in just defending the cows, but when his people saw him fall, they scattered willy-nilly, so we got so much swag. <laughs> we brought back 50 herds of cows and 50 flocks of sheep, 50 herd of swine, 50 herd of wandering goats, 150 horses. They were fillies. Most of them had foals underneath them. And then through the night, we brought these back to Pylos and to Nellius, my old man. Oh, and he was delighted. I mean, he didn't think I had it in me. I was still very young, too young even to fight in wars. <laughs> so first thing the next morning, heralds called everyone into the city. Everyone who the Epeans owed something. And then the leaders divvied everything up because there were many people who the Epeans owed. And Nellius, the old man, he chose out a huge herd of cows and sheep along with shepherds and cowboys because you know when you steal a flock of sheep, you steal the shepherds too. <laughs> Why did Nellius choose such a huge flock? because he was owed four of the best racehorses. Augeus, Augeus, who was the Epean leader, he had stolen these horses and their chariots right when they were about to run a race, a race with a tripod as a prize. And then their jockeys were like, and really missed their horses. And so Nellius was so pissed off. And that's why he took so much stuff. <laughs> but he also gave a lot. And he made sure that every man had his equal share. And then throughout the city, 
when we had divvied everything up, we made sacrifices to the gods. But on the third day, <laughs> the Apeans, horses, people, they armed and they went on the march. And there were these two guys called Molion. That's right, they were both called Molion. <laughs> and they went with them, even though they were just children. <laughs> they didn't know anything about war, but they put on their armor anyway. <clears throat> so there's a city, a city called Threeoesa. And Threeoesa, it's on an island in the middle of the Alpheus River. Not, not very far from Sandy Pylos. They were our allies. So this is where the Apeans marched to, and they camped all around the city, hoping to sack it. But Athena, Athena, before they even crossed the plain, Athena came down to Pylos with a message for all of us to arm. And we in Pylos woke up ready and willing and armed for war. Except that Nellius, my old man, wouldn't let me arm. He thought I was too young, so he hid my horses. But I didn't care. I went out with the cavalry on foot because I wanted to be awesome. <laughs> and because Athena had called us to conflict. There's another river. It's called the Minueos. And it flows near Arene into the sea. And this is where we waited for shining dawn. All of the cavalrymen armed and ready, all of the foot soldiers running around us. Then we marched, and we made it to the beautiful flowing streams of the Alphaeus River itself. So there we made beautiful sacrifices to Zeus, and we gave a bull to Alphaeus, the river god, and another bull to Poseidon. <coughs> and some kind of cow <laughs> to the bright-eyed goddess Athena. And then we all had dinner. <laughs> all along the army as we had ordered. And then we all went to sleep, each man in his own armor, on his own shield. Meanwhile, in three, three Oessa, they're still all camped out there wanting to sack the city. We didn't have to wait for long for the war work of Ares. Soon dawn came and spread light across the earth. And then, then we armed. And we marched out to war, praying to Athena and to Zeus. This is when the great conflict of the Apeans and the Pylians began. And I was the first to kill my man. One of the Molions. <laughs> this one <laughs> was the son-in-law of Algaeus, the Apeian leader. He had married his eldest daughter, Agamede, to Molion. Agamede, she was a girl that knew every drug that grew on the wide earth. Now I killed Molion hit him in the chest with my spear, and he fell from the horses, and I stole those horses. <laughs> and I took the horses and got them into the front line with the cavalry, and when his men saw him fall, knew that the best fighter they had was finished, they scattered willy-nilly. <laughs> then, then I fought like a whirlwind. Now I took 50 of their chariots. Ah, and each one of them had two men in it. <laughs> All those men that bit the dust, beaten down by my spear. You know, I would have killed both Molions. <laughs> Except 
Poseidon, I don't know if he was his dad or what, but he's the father in the line. He came and swooped Molion, the second Molion, out of battle in a deep mist. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> because Zeus, Zeus gave the power to the Pileans. And now, now we chase after the Apeans, cutting them down, killing their men, and collecting their beautiful armor all the way until we got to Buprasion. Buprasion and the Olenian rock, and there's also a hill there. I think they call it Alessius. Yes, when we got there at Buprasion, that was when Athena told us it was time to go home. So we went from Buprasion back to Pylos. And as we went, we prayed and gave thanks to Zeus among the gods, but to Nestor among men. <laughs> <laughs> That's what kind of man I was among men. <laughs> if I was, but Achilles. Achilles, he just wants to be awesome all on his lonesome. <laughs> <laughs> but what about you, son of Minoitius, Patroclus? Don't you remember what your father told you on that day when you left Thea and went to be part of Agamemnon's expedition? I do, because I was there. <laughs> Me and brilliant Odysseus. Yes, that's right. It's another story. <laughs> <laughs> it, was when, it was when we were going all through fertile Achaea, gathering the troops to go against Troy. And we found you in Peleus's courtyard, Peleus, the father of Achilles. You were there. Your father, Minoitius, the hero, was there. Achilles was sat just beside you. Peleus, he was preparing the fat oxen thighs and pouring fiery wine out of a golden cup as an offering. And I remember you and Achilles, you were in charge of the meat. <laughs> and when Achilles saw me and Odysseus standing in the doorway right away, Achilles jumped up and took me by the hand. Achilles offered me every hospitality. He did everything right. And when we had finished our desire for eating and drinking, well, then I began to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Telling you about our mission, seeing if you would go with us. And of course, the two of you were willing. And you were given orders, both of you by your fathers. Peleus said to Achilles, Achilles, be awesome always in battle. Stand out from the crowd. But Minoitius, Minoitius said to you, son, well, Achilles is much better than you by birth. <laughs> You're older, but he's also much stronger than you. But you can give him good advice. Show him the way. Even as awesome as he is, he will listen to you. That's what your father told you, and you have forgotten it. But even now, Patroclus, even now you might go to Achilles on behalf of the Achaeans. Who knows if some god might not come down and help you convince him. I mean, a friend's advice is already more convincing. Maybe Achilles holds back because of some knowledge from Zeus. Maybe it's what his lady mother Thetis knows. But even so, he could send you. You could lead all of the Myrmidons. 
you could even wear his armor. If you wore his armor, then, then the horse-breaking Trojans would hold back from battle. They would finally give the Achaeans a breather. And you know there's hardly any time for breathers in war. Besides, you're fresh. The Trojans are tired. You could drive them back to their city, away from our ships and our tents. That's what he said. And he stirred up the heart and the spirit in Patroclus. And right away, Patroclus went running through the ships and the tents of the Achaeans until he got to the boat of Odysseus. This is where they have all the assemblies. This is also where decrees are made, and they have also built altars to the gods. And it is here that he runs into Eurypylus. Eurypylus, who is limping out of war, sweat dripping from the top of his head, down his back and down his shoulders, blood still spurting out of his arrow wound. <laughs> But his mind is still sharp, and when Patroclus, the son of Minoetius, sees him, he pities him. Oh, miserable leaders of, of the Trojans, is it now our fate that we're about to die here, far from Argos, that we're going to feed the fast Trojan dogs with our fat? Tell me, Eurypylus. Can the Argive leaders still hold back huge Hector? Are they being destroyed? Are they being beaten down by his spears? And Eurypylus, wounded, said, Patroclus, the Achaeans, we're not going to be any longer at all. We will be fallen beside our black ships, all of them. As, as many as were awesome before, they are all wounded, hit by Trojan hands and arrows and spears lying up in their ships. But come, you can save me. Take me back to the ship. Cut this arrow out of my leg. And you, you know the good drugs. Achilles taught you them. Achilles, who learned them from Chiron the centaur. Because our doctors, Podoleros and Macaon, well, Macaon, he's lying up in his own tent, waiting for a blameless doctor, and Podolaris, he's still in the sharp field of Ares, fighting on. And Patroclus, the son of Minoetius, answered, Oh, man, what am I supposed to do? Hero Eurypylus, what are we going to do? <laughs> I'm supposed to go back to Achilles with this message from Nestor, the son of Neleus. But I can't leave you here like this, all wore out. That's what he said. And he took his arm around his chest, and he took him back to the hero's tent. And Eurypylus' sidekick laid out hides for him. And he laid down, and Patroclus, with a big knife, cut the arrow out of his thigh. And then he ground up bitter roots with pain-killing properties. <laughs> and he spread them on the wound after washing it out with warm water, all the black blood away. And so the wound dried up, the blood stopped, and that's how Patroclus treated Eurypylus in his tent. But the Argives and the Trojans still fought on all along the wall. This wall of the Achaeans that they had built above their ships with a trench in front of it. It wasn't going to last long. You know why? Because they didn't give the gods hecatombs when they built it. Hecatombs, the sacrifice of a hundred oxen. So they had built this wall, and they had put their ships and their swag safe behind it, but it wasn't going to last long. It was built against the will of the gods. 
So as long as Hector was still alive, as long as Achilles was still raging, as long as the city of Priam remained unsacked, that's how long this wall would hold. But when most of the best Trojans were dead, when a lot of the Argives had died too, some of them had left, when the city of Priam was sacked and all of the Argives had gone to their own countries, that's when Poseidon and Apollo destroyed this wall. <laughs> Apollo, he took all of the nine rivers that flowed down from Mount Ida. These were the rivers that were full of helmets and shields and the race of demigods that had fallen. It was the Resios and the Heptaporos, the Casarsos, the Rhodios, the Grenicos, the Asipos, the Shining, Scamandros, the Simois, all of these rivers he took into one giant river. And he poured this river against the wall for nine straight days. And the whole time, Zeus sent a downpour so that the wall would wash more easily into the sea. And Poseidon himself, he stood there with a trident, prying up the stones and the bricks of the foundation that the Achaeans had worked so hard to lay. And then Apollo, he took the roaring Hellespond and he evened everything out. And he put a whole new beach over the wall that was destroyed. And then he made all of the rivers go back to where they once were where they had flowed their beautiful streams before. So that's what Poseidon and Apollo were going to do to the wall, you know, in the future, but in our past. Whatever. <laughs> right now, they were just fighting around the wall, OK? Yeah. And the archives, they were not doing so great. They were lashed by Zeus's whip. They were being pushed back, shut in by their hollow ships. <laughs> and Hector, <laughs> Hector, he fought just like he had before, like a whirlwind. <laughs> Hector, he fought, he was like a lion or like a wild boar when he is surrounded, surrounded by hunting dogs and by men, and they make a wall around him, but his courageous heart does not make him afraid, does not make him withdraw. Instead, his manly courage is going to kill him. But still, he rushes at them, trying to break them up. That's how now, wherever he rushed the Achaeans, they would give way. Now Hector, he called out to all of his companions, trying to get them to go across the ditch. But the ditch, well, the horses were not going to cross this ditch. They just stood on the overhanging lip of it, neighing. A lot. <laughs> because the ditch, the ditch has overhanging lips on both sides that stretch the whole length of it. And in the center, there are stakes, sharpened stakes, that are set close together in the ground. That's what the Achaeans put in there to stop their enemies. So the horses, they can't jump over it and they can't run into it. But a man on foot, he can accomplish what he wants to do. So Polydamus. Polydamus came and stood next to Hector. Can I take that for a minute? Thanks. And said to him, Hector, Hector and all of you other Trojan leaders. So I think it's pretty crazy to try to cross the ditch on horses. Um, they can't cross that ditch. <laughs> it's quite narrow. They would get injured. OK, so listen. So I really want Zeus to be thinking bad things against all of the Argives, and I really hope that they die here, completely nameless, far from Argos. I mean, that would be great. That would be, that would be great. Um, but why don't, why don't we just all listen to me then, and uh, we can leave, leave our chariots here with our sidekicks, 
and then all of us can put our arm around and we can follow Kimu Schachter. I mean, he's pretty, pretty awesome. And then, if there's actually destruction fixed all over the archives, then we should be fine on foot, right? And they won't hold out long against us. That's what Polydamus said. And Hector liked the idea of that. So right away, he jumped down from his chariot with all of his armor onto the ground, and all of the other Trojan leaders, they jumped down to the ground as well when they saw brilliant Hector doing it. And now they all gave their chariots to their sidekicks, and they arranged themselves into five battalions. Hector led the first. And with him was Polydamus. And Cabriones, who I left on the floor over there, which is too bad. <laughs> Cabriones, even though he was a charioteer, he was too awesome, right? So Hector left his horses with a worse man than him. The second battalion was Alexandros, Paris, and with him the two sons of Antinor, who were Archelychus and Achamas. Then it was Deiphobus. Deiphobus and Helenos were the two sons of Priam. And their third was Osios. Osios was the son of Hertakos. He had come all the way from Risby on his flaming horses. <laughs> Around the river Phileas. Finally, it was Aeneas. Oh my god, we have too many people. <laughs> Marie, do you want them on the other side? Aeneas, the strong son of Anchises. <laughs> and with him went Agenor and Alcathuis. And finally, and they both really knew how to fight. Sarkodon led the famous allies, and he chose Glaucus and Asteropius to go with him. <laughs> Glaucus and Asteropius, whom Sarkodon at least thought was the best. After him, of course, because Sarkodon was really the best. <laughs> Hi now. Now we can all just chill. So all of these men were gathered, and they got their shields, and they put themselves in order, and all of them listened to Polydamus' advice. All of them, except for Osios. <laughs> Osios, the son of Hyrtakos, well, he wanted his horses and his chariots. I mean, they were fiery, right? <laughs> so he led them, but bad things were going to happen to him leading those horses and chariots across the ditch and towards the ships. Bad things and a bad fate was going to fix on him with the spear of Idomeneus, the son of Deucalion. But still, Osseus went. He rushed his horses towards the left side of the wall. This was a place where the Achaeans sent out all of their men and their horses. And they found it there that the door and the huge bolts were not actually closed all the way. They had left them open, the Achaeans had, to try to save their friends who were running away. And so now, Osios, he threw all of his force going there. Except they found two men inside. Now these two men were the best men ever. <laughs> the sons of the spear-fighting Lapis, Leontius, who was the scion of Ares, and Polypointes, who was the strong son of Perithuis. These two men, they were like two oaks. They grow high up in the mountains, and they have such tall branches, and they, they stand up to the wind and the rain day after day, and their strong roots keep them in the mountain. That's what these two men were like. And when they saw Asios rushing towards them, well, they were not scared, and they did not run away. But now the battle cry went all up around Osios and Diamenos 
and Orestes, and Asios' son Adamos, and Thoon, and Onomaos. But these two, they shouted out to all of the Achaeans who were inside to come and defend the ships. And now there was fear and upset among the Danaeans. But these two, they ran out. They ran out like boars, wild boars running into the woods, turning on the very hunting dogs and the hunters that come after them, gnashing their teeth. And the sound of their gnashing teeth, that was like the sound of the bronze spears bouncing off their bronze breastplates as they fought hard. And Osios, he kept rushing, but now, these two were trusting in the strength of the men who were up above them because the Achaeans, they were up on the towers. They were throwing down stones, parts of the foundation, and they were bouncing off the helmets and the shields. They were falling like snowflakes, like snowflakes up the mountain that get rushing in in the wind and they fall all over the earth. And Osios, the son of Hirtakos, he just hit both of his thighs with his hands, and he was like, Zeus, father, now I feel like you are just, well, you've made yourself into a real lover of lies, haven't you? I thought that we were going to beat these Achaeans, that they couldn't hold up under the strength of our battle fury and our invincible hands, but these two guys, you know, I thought, I thought that they would just leave. But no, instead they're like small wasted wasps who build a home at the side of the road. And then when men come near them, instead of just abandoning the home, they stay and sting the men and fight over their young. That's how these two are. They would rather kill or be killed than leave their post. That's what he said. But Zeus didn't care. Zeus was not convinced. He just wanted to give the glory to Hector. So now the Argives, though, they were pressed hard by necessity. Now they had to defend their ships. And the gods that supported the Argives, they were sad. But these two, they fought on with a special kind of rage. First it was Polypoites, the son of Perithuis. He killed Damasos. Killed Damasos by striking him through the head. He was wearing a bronze cheek shield, and that spear went through bronze and through bone, and it spattered the brain all inside. <laughs> then he killed Pylon. Oh, no. Then he killed Ormenius. And, and then Leontius, the Scion of Ares, he killed Hippomachus' son, oh no, sorry, Antimachus' son, Hippomachus. <laughs> <laughs> Got him with the spear straight through the zoster. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right. Then Antiphantes came close to him, rushing in front, but he pulled his sword out of his sheath and hacked at him and killed him too. Then Medon. <laughs> <laughs> then Yamenos. Then Orestes. Which one? There's only one in this one. It's one of Osios' guys. Not Agamemnon's son. Okay. So these two, they killed all of these men and they stripped their bodies. Meanwhile, all of those that had followed Hector and Polydamus were still standing on the edge of the trench. Why? Because a bird had come <laughs> on the left side of the people. It was an eagle. It was an eagle holding in its sharp talons a blood-colored snake. And the snake was still alive and writhing. And the snake struck back, biting the eagle at the chest right by the neck. So the eagle screamed and dropped the snake. So it was right in the middle of all the Trojans. And then the eagle flew off on a breath of air. And so all the Trojans 
Well, they were all just stood there, <laughs> shuddering at the snake writhing amongst them. <coughs> Bad omen from the gods. Thing. Thank you so much.